skies will be filled with the greatest air armada the world has ever seen. Our own Army Air Forces, the best planes ever built, 65,000 planes this year. And by the time you finish your training, America will have overwhelming superiority in the air. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, as Bill said, my name is Don Johnson, and I'm a docent here at the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs. And this morning, the topic of discussion is going to be the siege of Malta. So here we go. Malta is a tiny island country in the middle of the Mediterranean. It's actually an archipelago of only 122 square miles total area. Um, because it's a tiny island country, it's not able to produce enough food locally to feed its population, so it's always been dependent on shipping. And throughout its long history, it's been ruled by many uh, empires to include the Romans, the Greeks, and the Carthaginians. And British rule began in 1813 when it became a colony. For a time during World War II, Malta had the distinction of being called the most bombed island in the world. The picture you see up here is of the Royal Opera House, or at least the remains of the Royal Opera House. And during the bombings, 30,000 buildings on Malta were reduced to rubble. Now regarding the pictures, if you notice in the bottom right hand part of the screen, you're going to see watermarks on most of the photos that I used. It's, it says IWM. That's because I borrowed heavily from the Imperial War Museum collection. If you go to their website and you type in Malta, you'll get over 1,600 photos. So that's what you're going to see here. Now during this time, living conditions on Malta were appalling. Food and medicine were rationed heavily. There's always a shortage of water, both for sanitation and for drinking. In fact, this uh, caused a rampant dysentery during the, the entire time. In fact, the Maltese had their own name for dysentery. They called it the Malta dog because it would follow you around. Uh, the photo you see up here is a bunch of people getting water out of a well in the street because the water mains are broken. The people on Malta suffered uh, multiple air raids almost daily during the siege. Fuel and ammunition were always critically low. And something I wanted to point out in this picture here is you'll notice that the hay-powered modes of transportation outnumber the petrol-powered modes by a ratio of three to two. Uh, pedal power, or bicycles, was also a popular means of getting around during the siege. Another interesting thing about the siege is you see the way that car is painted there to the right. It's painted to blend in with all the rubble. This is called rubble wall camouflage, and you would see it on vehicles and equipment and even on helmets like you see here. So why did this tiny little island in the middle of nowhere inspire so much wrath? Why were the British so intent on holding on to it? I'll, we'll get questions at the end, but I'm going to answer these questions. These are rhetorical. <laughs> but thanks. Yep, hold it till the end. Um, why did Mussolini and later the Germans, why did they want to take the island so badly? Well, let's look at Mussolini first. Uh, before World War I, Mussolini was an ardent socialist. But when World War I broke out, he had a split with the Socialist Party. The Italian Socialists favored neutrality, but Mussolini was very much in favor of getting into the war. He saw it as a revolution. And it was an opportunity to overthrow the Austro-Hungarian dynasty. And so, his rift with the socialists grew to such a point that he eventually left the Socialist Party and began adopting ideas of, of fascism. Now fascism, just in case you don't know, is a brand of totalitarianism that's characterized by militarism, extreme dictatorial control, um, a rigid social hierarchy that typically manifests as racism, and most importantly is extreme control of the economy by the government. That's what fascism is, and that's what sets it apart a little bit from other brands of totalitarianism. So after World War II, Mussolini organized um, ex-soldiers into gangs of black shirt thugs for the purpose of intimidating rival political groups. The photo you see here is from a march on Rome that he organized in 1922 with 30,000 black shirts for the purpose of intimidating the king into appointing him the prime minister. Well, it worked, and so he was appointed in 1922. In 1925, through nefarious means, Mussolini had um, himself appointed the sole head of the Italian government, and he began systematically dissolving all restraints on his power. 
1927, Italy was officially a police state. He believed that it was Italy's destiny and his own to recreate the glory of the uh, Roman Empire. He was going to do this by dominating the entire Mediterranean basin and taking all of the lands around the Mediterranean for what he called Italy's spazio vitale, or living space. Now, in these endeavors, he was absolutely ruthless. So when suppressing an uprising in Libya and later during the invasion of Ethiopia, uh, they used poison gas to suppress the people. They committed uh, mass atrocities and genocide. Now, when Italy was sanctioned for these events by the um, French and um, English-dominated League of Nations, he took this as a sign of what he called the crumbling, decaying empire's hypocrisy. And so he refused to accept the criticism. Now, if all this sounds familiar, it's because it is. Uh, this roadmap would later be followed by another um, genocidal psychopath to the north, Adolf Hitler. Now, Malta was going to be critical to Mussolini's plans for the Mediterranean because of its location. As I said, Malta sits in the dead center of the Mediterranean. It sits astride the intersection of two critical lines of communication. The first line is the north-south line that connects Italy to her colony in Libya. Malta, being right next to this line, is in a position to interfere with uh, shipping that goes between Italy and Libya. Libya, of course, was Mussolini's foothold in North Africa, the base from which he was going to expand his empire. And so Malta was a threat to Mussolini's plans. The other line is the east-west line that connects Britain to her colonies in the Middle East and then through the Suez Canal to her colonies in South Africa and the Far East. So Malta was used as the, by the British as a base to control the flow of traffic through the Mediterranean. So Mussolini would have to take Malta from the British. To do this, he was going to first cut it off by uh, keeping the British from resupplying the island with shipping. So he's going to sink their ships in order to starve the garrison and force it to um, a position of surrender or uh, get it ready for invasion. The other thing he was going to have to do to, to neutralize it as a base of operations was to bomb it into submission. So on the 10th of June, 1940, France was only two weeks away from ultimately surrendering to the Germans, and Mussolini saw his opportunity. So he declared war on France and England on the 10th of June. The very next day, the 11th of June, he began the siege of Malta. And because the British were going to resist so stubbornly, and fight their resupply uh, convoys through to Malta, the siege would last two and a half years. So initially, the targets of the Regia Aeronautica, which is the Italian Air Force, were primarily military targets, such as Grand Harbor, and the British airfields at Takali, and Lucca, and Halfar. Now, however, civilian targets would also be bombed as well. Now, the Regia Aeronautica favored bombing from high altitudes, which resulted in negligible accuracy and disproportionate collateral damage. As I mentioned, Malta was a British base of operations. They had an offensive air and sea capability consisting of primarily uh, Wellington bombers and, as you see up here, ferry albacore torpedo bombers. Uh, but their most effective weapon against shipping was their submarine fleet, which was based on Malta. And as was the case across much of the thinly stretched uh, British Empire at the time, Malta was inadequately prepared to, to uh, defend itself against the coming storm. They had an insufficient number of anti-aircraft artillery, and they had only a single early warning radar site. Their defensive fighter force consisted of only six obsolete Gloucester Sea Gladiator biplanes hastily borrowed from the Royal Navy and based at Halfar Airfield. They were too few to be considered a squadron, so they were designated the Halfar Fighter Flight. They were flown by bomber and reconnaissance pilots who had been given a crash course in fighter tactics. Now, because there was only six, the Maltese would only see two or three at any one time climbing up to take on the incoming Italian raids. So the rumors began to spread that there were only three in total, and so the Maltese named them Faith, Hope, and Charity. <laughs> and an enduring legend was born. The opposing Italian fighters at the time were the uh, Fiat CR-42 Falco and the Maki C-200 Sayeta. 
The uh, primary Italian bomber is the uh, Savoia Marchetti SM-79 Sparviero. Now you can see the gladiators are outmatched by the Italian fighters and they're unable to catch the faster Sparviero's unless they can be surprised with a, a high-speed dive from higher altitude. However, in spite of this, the gladiators held the line for the first 10 days of the siege. But if Malta was going to survive, it was going to take much more than just faith, hope, and charity. So luckily for the Maltese, on the 21st of June, eight Her uh, Hawker Hurricane Mark I's arrived. They'd been flown through France. The Hurricanes are more than a match for their Italian adversaries, and they arrived not a moment too soon, because on the very day that they arrived, two of the gladiators were written off in landing accidents. Now, the Hawker Hurricanes had an instantaneous positive effect. However, they weren't going to last very long, because by the beginning of August, every single one of them was grounded for a lack of spare parts. Malta was going to develop a reputation for destroying aircraft, both Allied and Axis. The British had a pressing need to get more airplanes to Malta, both to counter the high rate of attrition and to build up their fighter force. They just lost their ferry route with the fall of France to the Germans, and so they had to come up with a new way to get airplanes to Malta. So on the 2nd of August, 11 additional hurricanes arrived. These had been loaded in Greenock, Scotland, aboard the HMS Argus, and then flown, or sailed through the Atlantic, around Portugal and Spain, through the Strait of Gibraltar, to within 380 miles flying distance of Malta. The hurricanes then launched from the Argus along with a couple of Blackburn skuas to guide them to Malta, and they flew the rest of the way. This operation was aptly named Operation Hurry. <laughs> this became the blueprint for 27 more supply missions just like it over the next two years, which would ultimately deliver over 700 aircraft and pilots to the beleaguered uh, island of Malta and these became known as club runs. The British Mediterranean fleet was not just doing resupply missions for Malta, they were also very much on the offensive. On the night of 11 and 12 November, they executed a brilliant action which would have global and historic repercussions. This was named Operation Judgment. The objective of Judgment was to either mitigate or eliminate, if possible, the striking power of the Italian fleet. So based on reconnaissance collected by Malta-based aircraft, the British launched two waves of ferry swordfish from the, um, the aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious to attack the Italian fleet at their anchorage at Taranto. Most of the swordfish got through successfully and launched their weapons with devastating results. Three Italian battleships were crippled and put out of action, effectively cutting the Italian uh, Mediterranean battleship fleet in half. When news of the attack reached Berlin, Hitler is said to begin to doubt his Italian allies' ability to take North Africa, and he began to consider intervention in the Mediterranean. When the news reached Tokyo, the Japanese dispatched their attaché in Berlin to Taranto to investigate and send back a report. The report that he sent back found its way to the desk of Admiral Yamamoto, who was uh, crafting his plans to deal with the American Pacific Fleet. This attack heralded what um, air power advocates around the world, including American Billy Mitchell, had been shouting for years, that the days of the battleship were numbered and air power is on the ascendant. Shortly after Taranto, the British would have another pivotal victory in North Africa, which would change the balance of power. On the 10th and 11th of December, uh, as part of a larger operation called Operation Compass, at the Battle of Sidi Barani, the, de the uh, British Western Desert Force defeated major elements of the Italian 10th Army. This defeat would lead to the complete eviction of the Italian Army from Egypt and the capture of the uh, Libyan ports by the British. So these events, plus the recently Italian, uh, the failed Italian um, invasion of Greece, convinced Hitler that without immediate German intervention, Italy would soon falter and thereby he would have a problem on his southern flank. So Hitler issued Directive 22, dispatching the first elements of the Deutsches Afrika Corps to North Africa under the command of General Leutnant Erwin Rommel. He also sent 10 Flieger Corps to Sicily to deal with Malta. And at this point, the, si the siege is now six months old, and the number of civilian casualties on Malta has totaled 88. At the beginning of 1941, uh, 
1941 is marked by the arrival of the Germans in the Mediterranean. This represents a tremendously increased threat to the island of Malta. Ten Flieger Corps in Sicily has brought with them the latest in German aircraft technology to include the, the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka, the uh, Heinkel HE-111 and Junkers Ju-88 bombers, and the Messerschmitt Bf-109E or Emil fighter. Ten Flieger Corps would soon make their presence felt. On the 10th of January, Illustrious was discovered escorting a resupply convoy through the Mediterranean and was promptly attacked. The first attack would come from the Italians. So two torpedo-equipped Sparvieros made an ineffective attack. Both of the torpedoes missed. But that was followed by two waves of Stukas who had a very effective attack. Um, they scored six direct hits and three near misses and caused tremendous damage to the Illustrious. The rest of the, uh, the ships in the convoy also suffered tremendous damage and severe loss of life. The Illustrious was forced to limp into Grand Harbor on Malta where she would stay till the end of the month for emergency repairs. So concerning the arrival of the Germans in the Mediterranean, one Malta hurricane pilot is quoted as saying, until the advent of the Luftwaffe, it would seem to have been a gentleman's air war. It was soon obvious that the uh, German Emmels outclassed the hurricanes. From February to May, the Germans scored 42 kills over Malta-based aircraft with no losses to themselves. However, not all of their success was due only to their technical superiority. British tactics and procedures also played their part. For example, the British were still using the inflexible and outdated three-plane V or VIC fighter formation. The Germans had long since abandoned that. They had adopted the four-plane Schwarm, which is comprised, comprised of two two-plane Rotten. The British also had inadequate radar coverage, which resulted in delayed warnings, late scrambles, and their fighters intercepting at lower altitudes than was optimal. So to counter this problem, the uh, British fighter planes, when they're scrambled from Malta, tended to climb to the south before they would turn to the north, thus giving the incoming raiders time to drop their bombs on their targets before being intercepted. However, in May, Hitler was about to issue Malta a temporary reprieve. Because of their upcoming uh, surprise invasion of the Soviet Union, the Germans began to pull flying units out of Sicily and send them up to a uh, stage for the Russian invasion. They also started uh, taking units out of Sicily for Operation Mercury, which was the German invasion of Crete. Now, Mercury would end in a Pyrrhic victory for Hitler. The British were gonna make very good use of ULTRA, their super secret program for decrypting intercepted radio transmissions. So knowing the Germans' plans allowed them or enabled them to inflict massive casualties on the German paratroops and shoot down a high number of German transport aircraft. So Hitler was going to remember Operation Mercury later on when making critical decisions concerning the invasion of Malta. So the British on Malta took advantage of the, uh, the lull and they reinforced the garrison. They increased the number of heavy anti-aircraft artillery and they built up their reserves of food, ammunition, and fuel. And most importantly, they reinforced their hurricane squadrons. However, the hiatus would not last very long. In October, the Italians introduced a new fighter plane in the Mediterranean, one of the best that they would produce during the entire war, the Maki Cia 202 Folgari. Now, the Italian aircraft designers, although they were very talented, their designs had become hampered over time by lagging uh, Italian engine technology. So to resolve the shortcoming, they turned to their German allies. The Italian company Alfa Romeo began license producing the German um, Daimler-Benz DB601A engine, the same engine that powered the BF109Es. Now this new engine brought their, um, their aircraft design, such as the Fulgore, up to Western standards and actually gave the Fulgore an edge over the uh, hurricanes. Now when we get to November of 1941, the Germans um, are beginning to pull aircraft away from Russia again because the winter flying weather in Russia gets so bad that it hampers flying operations. This allows them to migrate their airplanes south again to Sicily. Um, this time, when 10 Flieger Corps came back, they were accompanied with uh, two Flieger Corps. So there are now two air uh, flotillas in Sicily. 
And when they came back, they brought with them the newest version of the BF-109, the F model, or Friedrich, thus giving them even more advantage over the hurricanes. This move south was accompanied by a reorganization of the Mediterranean command structure. General Feld Marshal Albert Kesselring was sent to be the commander in chief south, subordinate only to Mussolini. Kesselring was a Bavarian who'd begun his career in the artillery during World War I and fought on both the Eastern and Western fronts. And between the wars, he was transferred to the air staff, eventually becoming the chief of the air staff, where he played a significant role in the re-establishment of the Luftwaffe. However, in this position, he was often at odds with his uh, boss, uh, General der Flieger Erhard Milch. And these disagreements rose to such a level that he eventually requested a transfer to a field command. So during the Battle of Britain, he was in command of Luftflotte II over in Belgium. Luftflotte II was the largest air fleet in the German Luftwaffe with responsibility for the attacks on the southeast of England where he would come in contact with Air Vice Marshal Keith Park's 11 group. The lessons Kesselring learned during the Battle of Britain, many written in blood, would accompany him to the Mediterranean. So when he arrived in December, he immediately opened a new offensive against Malta. The Luftwaffe assumed the majority of daylight operations from the Regia Aeronautica, and the effect was immediate. Uh, in October, Malta had 52 air raid warnings. In November, the number rose to 87, and when Kesselring showed up in December, they had 159 air raid warnings just that one month. Multi-civilian casualties for 1941 totaled 300. So these events caused the leadership on Malta to appeal to Britain for more help. So the situation on Malta at the beginning of 1942 was this. The number of radar sites had been increased to three, so they had better coverage. They now had three squadrons of Hurricane Mark IIs, as opposed to the Mark Is, based at Takali and how far. Um, however, the hurricanes being outclassed, what was worse is they were also outnumbered. They were about three to one uh, against the Axis. Despite all this, on the 22nd of January, it was an auspicious occasion because on this day, a Malta hurricane pilot succeeded in shooting down the first BF-109, the first one that had been brought down by fighter action over Malta. The beginning of February, a uh, new arrival to Malta was the uh, squadron leader, Stan Turner. Stan Turner brought with him and implemented a brand new um, fighter formation. The English called it the Finger Four. And if it looks familiar, that's because it is. It's identical to the German Schwarm. But at least by now adopting it, if it doesn't give them advantage, at least it gives them tactical parity with the Germans. Uh, also in February, the English added two more radar sites, bringing the total now up to five. And the Maltese controllers took immediate advantage of the increased coverage. This allowed them to increase the warning time and give their uh, fighter pilots precious time to, to gain the altitude advantage that they need before intercepting. On the 7th of March, Malta received a desperately needed upgrade to their fighter defenses with the arrival of 15 Spitfire Mark V Bs. These were flown via Operation Spotter off of the HMS Eagle. The Spitfires have the speed, the climb rate, the maneuverability, and the firepower to deal with their Axis uh, adversaries. However, Malta's gonna need a lot more than 15 to turn the tide. Also during Operation Spotter, the first American volunteers appeared on Malta. Now the Americans have been fighting for the uh, RAF for some time in violation of America's neutrality acts. However, now that America was officially in the war, these guys are no longer considered outlaws. The Spitfires and the new pilots begin to turn the tide immediately. Within the first 20 days of their arrival, they score 20 kills for only four losses. And before the end of March, seven more Spitfires would arrive along them with more Americans via Operation Pickett. The photo you see up here is actually taken during Pickett aboard the HMS uh, Eagle. You see a bunch of the relief pilots and the guy on the right is an American, you can tell from the patch on his shoulder. Around this time, the Germans and the Italians were preparing for the invasion of Malta. The Germans are gonna call it Operation Hercules. However, air superiority, as always, would be a prerequisite. And Kesselring knows that his failure to achieve air superiority over the English during the Battle of Britain had cost Germany its chances for invasion. And he vowed that this time would be different. 
And what's worse, he's up against the clock. Because it's March, the uh, Germans would soon start taking airplanes away from him again and sending them north to Russia for the summer offensive in Russia. So he's got to do something quick. So in April, he opens a ferocious new offensive. In five and a half weeks, the Axis is going to fly over 12,000 aircraft sorties over Malta. They're going to drop 6,728 tons of bombs. Now, if you want to know how much that is, um, it's interesting to know that the Germans dropped a total of 18,000 tons of bombs during the entire blitz on England that followed the Battle of Britain. And so here you have more than a third of that being dropped in just five and a half weeks on poor Malta. The attacks would come in waves of 80 to 100 aircraft. If the defenders were able to launch four Spitfires and six Hurricanes, that was considered a maximum effort because their pilots were perpetually exhausted and their aircraft supply was always dwindling. However, during the Blitz in April, Malta received a bit of good news. They were notified by England that they had been awarded the George Cross for their efforts. However, it was considered too dangerous at the time to hold the ceremony, and so that would have to wait till a later time. On the 20th of April, 48 Spitfires and pilots arrived via Operation Calendar. Calendar was unique because this was the first club run for the American aircraft carrier USS Wasp. Churchill had made a personal plea uh, to President Roosevelt, who agreed to loan the English the use of the Wasp to help with the situation on Malta. Also to arrive during calendar was American Reed Tilly. Reed is an Eagle Squadron volunteer, or ex-Eagle Squadron pilot from Florida. He would go on to score seven victories over Malta and become the first American to be awarded the British Distinguished Flying Cross for his efforts in the Malta campaign. Uh, Reed Tilly, by the way, is also featured here in our museum. On the 9th of May, the Wasp was back for her second and last club run, this time accompanied by the HMS Eagle, and together they carried 67 Spitfires for the relief of Malta. However, three of the Spitfires remained aboard ship because they were unserviceable that day, and one crashed on takeoff. And one of them returned to the ships because he had an inoperative ferry tank fuel pump, so he would not be able to have enough gas to make the 400-mile uh, trip to Malta. In the photo on the left there, you can see one of those 90-gallon ferry tanks, or as they called them, a slipper tank, attached to the belly of the Spitfire. The pilot who came back was Jerry, uh, Canadian Jerry Smith, he had decided not to ditch his valuable Spitfire. So he came back and he orbited to burn down gas and wait for the rest of the deck to clear. So once the rest of the Spitfires took off, he came back to attempt a landing aboard the, uh, the, uh, the Wasp. Getting tongue-tied, sorry. Um, it's interesting to note, this is something his airplane is not equipped for. He doesn't have a tail hook, for one thing. And he's not trained to do. Nonetheless, his first attempt ended in a wave off. So that's where the landing signal officer on the ship thinks you're not in a position to land, and he waves the paddles over his head. That means give it power, uh, go around and try it again. So on his second attempt, he was successful. He landed his Spitfire aboard the Wasp and was able to stop it within six feet of the uh, forward end of the flight deck. <laughs> that landing signal officer that sent him around, by the way, was none other than Dave McCampbell. Uh, Dave would go on to score 34 victories becoming the highest scoring uh, U.S. Navy ace and the third highest scoring American ace overall. Um, I wanted to point out McCampbell is also, by the way, featured here in our museum. So you guys have an Easter egg hunt to go on. <laughs> by the end of May, there were enough Americans serving on Malta that they established an all-American flight within number 126 squadron on uh, Lucca. The second uh, operation of the month was um, I'm sorry, we're in June now, okay. June was a banner month for uh, club runs. They were gonna do two club runs, uh, delivering 60 more Spitfires to Malta. The first operation was Operation Style, and Style was unique because it's the first time that the Germans actually intercept in inbound Spitfires. So they shot down two of them west of Pantelleria, two more near Gozo, and a fifth one landed, uh, crash landed upon attempting to land at Takali. On the second run of the month, Operation Salient, one of the young pilots delivered was a 20-year-old Canadian from Montreal. Now this young fellow, when the war started, he really wanted to be a fighter pilot. 
Uh, the problem was the Royal Canadian Air Force had education standards that he didn't quite meet. So he heard that the Chinese Air Force would take volunteers. So he made his way through America to the American West Coast, only to be turned back to Canada by the American authorities because he didn't have the proper documentation with him. So not to be deterred, he then turned to the Finnish Air Force who needed volunteers to help with their fight with the Russians during their winter war of 1939 and 40. However, this time, his father refused to sign the waiver because he's too young. Okay, we're not gonna let a simple thing like paperwork stop us from becoming a fighter pilot, right? So, he gets a job on an ammunition freighter crossing the Atlantic to go to Scotland. Now on the way there, seven of the ships in his convoy are torpedoed and sunk by German submarines. But when he gets to Scotland, he presents himself to the RAF recruiting station and they turn him away because he forgot to bring his birth certificate. Okay, that's not gonna stop him either. So he braves two more dangerous Atlantic crossings. He goes back to Canada, grabs his birth certificate, and comes back to Scotland. And he's finally accepted into the Royal Air Force in September of 1940. This young man's name was George Burling. However, his squadron mates called him Buzz, or sometimes Screwball, <laughs> because that was his favorite expletive. Now Screwball would go on to add 26 victories in only four months on Malta making him the highest scoring ace of the Malta campaign, either Axis or Allied. Now June was gonna end with a fateful decision by Adolf Hitler. Uh, Hercules, the invasion plans, were in the final stages of planning and Hitler's um, enthusiasm for the invasion was waning for three particular reasons. For one thing, the plan was to rely heavily on paratroops and because of the paratroops performance during uh, the invasion of Crete, he doubted their effectiveness. Also, Rommel had a string of victories in the first half of 1942 that made it look like ultimate victory in North Africa was imminent. And third, and perhaps most importantly, Kesselring still did not own the skies over Malta. So on the 22nd, he issued his decision and Hercules was indefinitely postponed, effectively killing it. On the 14th of July, a short Sunderland flying boat arrived on Malta, bringing the replacement for Air Vice Marshal Hugh Lloyd Lloyd had been the air officer commanding on Malta for just over a year, and he was very well respected. He'd gotten the Maltese through a very difficult year. However, he was a bomber guy, and he didn't quite understand how to most effectively employ fighter airplanes in the defense of an airspace. So luckily for Malta, his replacement is a fighter pilot, Air Vice Marshal Keith Park. Park is a New Zealander who, just like Kesselring, had begun his career in the military back in World War I in the artillery. He had fought at Gallipoli and the Battle of the Somme. Later, he transferred to the Royal Flying Corps and he flew Bristol fighters, scoring 20 victories. He remained in the Royal Air Force between the wars and so when we get to the Battle of Britain, he's in command of 11 Group with the responsibility for the Southeast sector of England where he's gonna bear the brunt of Kesselring's attacks from Luftflotte II. He's gonna make brilliant use of the defensive system created by Hugh Dowding and uh, hit, uh, Churchill himself used to come down to the, air, the war room to watch Park work, and he called him the maestro because of his masterful handling of the, uh, the affair. And, and Park is about to face Kesselring again in the Mediterranean. When he arrives, he's dismayed to find that in the first half of July, only 8% of the incoming bomb raids have been successfully intercepted. So he immediately implements a new forward interception plan. From now on, he says, the bombers are gonna be intercepted north before they get to Malta. So there's no more climbing to the south. He's gonna use three or four elements of interceptors if he has four. But the first one is gonna go up and get the high fighter cover. The second one is gonna to go to the, the close fighter escort and strip them from the bombers. The third element goes after the bombers head on. And the fourth element, if we have one, uh, hangs back to get any of the bombers that break through. This began to work immediately. Uh, so now when the Axis bombers are approaching Malta, they, they tended to drop their bombs harmlessly into the water and turn for Sicily, rather than face um, this sort of opposition. By the 13th of September of 1942, it's considered safe enough on Malta, they can officially hold the uh, George Cross ceremony. This makes uh, Malta the first community, as opposed to an individual, to be awarded the George Cross which is awarded for acts of greatest heroism or for most conspicuous courage in circumstances of extreme danger. 
The Maltese are so proud of, of earning the George Cross that they incorporated it into their flag in 1943 and is actually still part of their flag today. However, Kesselring is not yet done with Malta. Even though invasion is now off the table, he still has hopes of helping Rommel win North Africa by crushing Malta. So he scrapes together 700 aircraft and he begins a new assault on October 11th. Uh, Malta is bombed day and night for a week straight. However, conditions are now very different from what they were in 1940 and 41 because the Maltese have five squadrons of Spitfires totaling over 100 aircraft. And Keith Park clearly owns the airspace over Malta. So within short order, the Axis suffers over 350 airplanes lost along with their air crews. So within two weeks, Kesselring is forced to admit defeat and he calls off the invasion or he calls off the assault, admitting that Malta is now hopeless. November would, would be the final decline of the Axis in North Africa. On the second, Montgomery defeats Rommel at the Second Battle of El Alamein. And on the eighth, the Allied invasion of French North Africa begins, Operation Torch, with landings in Morocco and Algeria. On the 20th, a resupply convoy safely reaches Grand Harbor. The convoy was named Operation Stone Age. By the end of December, the threat to Allied shipping in the Mediterranean is diminished to such a degree that the Allies no longer have to organize their ships into protective convoys to get them to Malta. So ships are sailing freely in ones and twos, and Malta is being resupplied at will. So although the fighting is not quite over, El Alamein, Operation Torch, and Operation Stone Age combined to effectively signal the end of the siege. So what happened next? For example, what happened to faith, hope, and charity? Uh, I'm sad to report that not a single one survived the siege. However, the fuselage of Gladiator November 5520, which is supposedly faith, was partially restored and presented to the people of Malta by Keith Park. And today, it is on display at Malta's National Museum of World War II in Fort St. Elmo in Valletta, and that's a picture of Faith over there. Not today, but probably a couple days ago. <laughs> what happened to the Wasp? Uh, following Operation ba uh, Bowery, she was sent to the Pacific Fleet, where she joined the fighting around uh, Guadalcanal. However, on September 15th, 1942, which is only two days after the George Cross Award Ceremony, she's torpedoed and sunk by the Japanese submarine I-19 southeast of San Cristobal Island. And this is only four months after she helped save Malta. She was rediscovered in January of 2019 by Paul Allen's research vessel, Petrel, and she currently rests in 14,000 feet of water. Uh, Burling, Screwball, he's an interesting guy. Uh, he gets shot down on the 14th of October, 1942. He survives, he bails out, um, but he's wounded, and so he's evacuated to Gibraltar. Now, on his way to Gibraltar, the airplane he was on crashed in the water. He survived the crash, um, and even though his leg was in a cast, he's able to swim to shore. So he's sent back to Canada to recuperate and then also take part in some publicity, which apparently he's not very good at. Um, he admits in public one time that he actually likes killing people. So they send him back to do what he likes to do, and he scores his last two kills in September and December of 1943. However, uh, Burling has a problem with authority and authority has a problem with Burling. So he's allowed to retire in October of 1944. Now he's unable to readjust to civilian life again, so he volunteers for the fledgling Israeli Air Force in 1948. So on his way to Israel, he's ferrying a Nordian Norseman uh, liaison aircraft and on takeoff from Rome, the Norseman explodes, killing Burling and his co-pilot. But Burling ended up being not only the highest scoring ace of the Malta campaign, he was also the highest scoring Canadian ace in history. Kesselring uh, remained commander in chief south, showing the esteem with which Hitler held him. Remember by the end of the war, Hitler had lost faith in every single one of his generals, except for Kesselring. Kesselring is one of the exceptions. Um, Kesselring was left in place to command the fighting retreat of the Germans uh, up the Italian, what they called up the bloody boot. 
He cost the Allies greatly in manpower and equipment and most importantly, time. So many historians consider this fighting retreat to be one of the most effective um, delaying actions ever fought in history. So he holds that distinction. However, after the war, like most of the generals left in the, uh, the German military, he was tried and convicted as a, a war criminal and sentenced to death. Uh, luckily for Kesselring, he was in Italy, and Italy had just abolished the death penalty, so the sentence was commuted to life in prison. But Kesselring had a number of fans, even on the British side, including Winston Churchill himself. Many of the generals who fought against him considered him to be an honorable soldier, and so they lobbied on his behalf. So in 1952, he was diagnosed with cancer, and they allowed him to go home um, because of ill health. So he lived another eight years, a very short, controversial time, and he died of a heart attack in 1960. Keith Park, this guy's a stud. Um, so Keith Park goes on to hold a number of command positions, including Allied Air Commander-in-Chief Southeast Asia. He's promoted to Air Chief Marshal, and he's knighted for his service to the Crown. He's forced to retire, however, in 1946. They said, thank you very much, but we have to make way for younger officers. And so he took a job with the Hawker Sidley Aircraft Company as a sales representative for Southeast Asia, which gave him the opportunity to go home to New Zealand, and he'd been gone for an awfully long time. Uh, following retirement from Hawker, he went into local politics, and Keith Park finally died in 1975, 32 years after he helped break the siege of Malta. So ladies and gentlemen, I think this is a good place to end the story. Thank you very much for coming out today.